All right, good morning, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, for those of you listening, this is gonna be a really uh, unique episode because Jason is an absolute expert at prospecting and cold outreach. And he and I worked together not too long ago, um, figuring out how to most effectively use video email in cold outreach. Um, so I'm gonna have a conversation here with him about you know the basics of video outreach, um, but a lot of our time here today is gonna be spent really on a very tactical approach to how to write a compelling email and how to work a video into a compelling sales email. So for all of you guys in the sales profession who wanna make video part of your sales outreach, this will be an episode to bookmark and re-listen to uh, multiple times because Jason is an absolute expert in this space. So Jason, thank you for coming on today. Yeah, I'm excited, man. We've gotten to talk a lot over the last few months and got, gotten to know each other pretty well. So it's, uh, it's always cool to be on the other end of things, man. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So first off, for, for people who hear video prospecting and don't even know what that means, can you just share the basics of like, you know, what mediums you can go through and even like what tools you can use to do video prospecting? Yeah. I mean, the reason why this even is a thing and, and why it works uh, for a lot of people is, you know, this concept of a pattern interrupt, you know, that people talk about a lot in sales and pattern interrupt is something that's been really interesting to me lately. And, and I've been looking into like what that is and what the origin of that is. And it actually comes from the opposite of like a sales context and like how to use it to interrupt a prospect's pattern. Uh, the science behind it is actually how to interrupt your own pattern. So people use it to overcome addiction or break bad habits and that sort of stuff. So essentially you slip into a habit and the thing you need to do to get out of that is to derail the habit, to completely do something differently and then replace it with a new habit and then practice. So where does this come in with prospecting? Your prospects open up cold emails, cold LinkedIn messages, et cetera, and they're conditioned to do this a very specific way, right? If you've been processing email for 10, 20, 30 years, however old you are, you probably do it the same way every time you do it. You see the same exact sort of stuff, you ignore the same things, et cetera, and slipping a video in there is gonna derail their normal pattern. It's, they're gonna see, oh, there's a thumbnail with a play button on it, on this email, or every time people connect with me on LinkedIn, they always pitch something and they always tell me what they want. This person sent me a video. So it's, it's going to derail that pattern that a prospect normally experiences on the receiving side of prospecting. And I think that's really where you need to start with prospecting is understanding the user experience on the receiving end of what you're doing. So that's where video can come in. So instead of sending a normal email, uh, just text-based, which those still work really well, we can throw a video in there where we can add a visual element um, to the equation, right? Because you, know, you look at an image, people say an image is worth 10,000 words or whatever it is, but the bottom line is that when someone sees something, that's gonna get them to start thinking, right? And that's what your brain does, is it tries to find patterns into like, why would someone put this video? What is this? What are they trying to say, et cetera? So it's really sparking that curiosity. So people embed them in emails, it works really well. People do them in welcome messages on LinkedIn. Um, those are, that's another place that you can do it that, that works really well. And, and those are the two places, really, you're taking existing channels and mediums and saying, let me add a visual element that's really going to stick out to the prospect. Yeah, cool. Um, so some people listen to this podcast won't know, but I am employed at a company called BombBomb, which is one video email communication tool that's out there, but there are others. So what are some of the tools that you've seen people using out there for video email communication? Uh, I mean, I've used BombBomb, I've used Vidyard. Uh, a lot of people are using Drift uh, these days. Um, I mean, Loom is another tool. There's lots of different tools. Um, some have more basic features, some have more advanced stuff, like BombBomb's got a lot more advanced you know, kind of things that you could do with videos. But um, if you're getting started, I would just pick one of the free apps, you know, to, just to try it, see if it works for you. Um, so that's a way that you can natively send it through an email, let's say. You can also use those links and embed them into a LinkedIn message. Uh, but if you're going to send videos on LinkedIn, usually the best way to do that is to natively send it through the mobile app. That way the person sees a video, they can actually click and watch within the app without having to click and be redirected um, into another app. So, uh, and then I guess you could record a, a video and host it somewhere like YouTube or video or Vimeo, excuse me, and put it in there, but that's a lot of steps, right? You're recording on your computer, you got to upload it, tag it, you know, share the link, et cetera. So those are typically the different ways that people use videos. Yeah, absolutely. And I would definitely agree with that, right? Start with what's simple, easy, and free at first, and then figure out if you need a more advanced solution or not. 
All right. Um, and then just, again, kind of a high level view. What are some scenarios when you've seen salespeople using personalized video messages? What are some of the use cases to some of the times in their process when they're using video? Yeah. So there's a lot of different instances that you can use it from a sales context um, and a prospecting context, but typically I see one of a few ways. So if you have your accounts tiered out or the people that you're reaching out to, and maybe you have like tier one, that's like, Hey, VPs and C levels at these particular industries we do really well at, and this company just has all the right things going and we could do really well with them versus a B or C, you know, priority or, or a tier two or tier three might be like, a total long shot, right? To work with these people or you don't have good contact information or it's like a below the line, you know, kind of persona that's like a manager type of person that doesn't make sense to spend extra effort on. So that's, that would be the first step. So, and then what you could do with those tier ones or those A accounts is you might lead with a video. And there's all different things that you could do with that video. If you're selling a product, for example, and let's say that you sell an e-commerce product that helps people optimize like their e-commerce Amazon pages or something. That was someone I talked to the other day did that. Um, and like what he does, so this is Lewis, I actually interviewed him on our podcast and I'm forgetting the name of the company that he works at. But what he'll do is he'll record a video or take a screenshot. Um, you could do either one, but he'll like go to their Amazon listing and show them where their competitors are outranking them for their own keywords, right? So if you're selling SEO services, maybe you could do that too, but you could show them through a video and it's like, Hey, Jonathan, I was doing some research on your Amazon page. I noticed that your competitors are showing up above you. Here's a quick video, right? And then you could show them in that video. So if you have a product like that, where you can visually see, um, like, a, cause a lot of people do in the SaaS world where it's like, they're helping with a particular workflow. So maybe it's sign up pages or optimizing certain things, or maybe you can show an example of a business like theirs. I know a tactic you like to use is talking about their competitors. So that might be a subject line is like the name of their competitor. Hey, I, I don't know if you know, but here's something I noticed that your competitor is doing. It seems to be working really well in an area where you can help them. So those are like more advanced type of videos that I think are a lot more fun. And then you could just do a regular video where you're holding up a piece of paper or a whiteboard and put the person's name on it. And you know, the message is more important than the medium. So you still have to say something good. It's not going to be a cure all to just embed a video in there. They'd be like, Oh God, Jason's so awesome. He sent me a video. Um, so you still need to follow a good format for a message, you know, Hey, Jonathan, um, personalization, like some sort of context into why you're reaching out to them. Hey, I was on your Amazon page, noticed this. One of the big problems that we hear from, et cetera, you know, companies is this. And one of the ways they're solving for it is this. And then your call to action, you know, the video. So you still need to follow a, a good sound uh, messaging format, you know, for your videos as well. Uh, th that would say that's the most common use case for, video and email. The other thing you could do is create triggers. So if you're using outreach or sales loft or vanilla soft or whatever other sales engagement tool you're using, you can send some emails and say, Hey, I want to focus extra effort on people that are opening those emails. So when they open up three or four times, you can say, Hey, I'm going to reach out to this person with a video. So that's another thing you could do. Those are the primary use cases through email. I would say, and then LinkedIn, what I've seen work really well. So, um, Kayla Citron Thayer, that's how you pronounce her last name, <laughs> interviewed her on the podcast and she likes doing welcome videos on LinkedIn, which I thought was really cool. So she'll connect with like IT professionals or like data science type folks, send the connection requests. And as soon as they connect, she'll send a welcome video and she uses Drift and she uh, takes a, she does like the screen view. So like she'll be on the prospect's LinkedIn profile. That'll be like the thumbnail for the video so that you can see that it's personalized. And she'll be like, hey, I was on your profile. I noticed this, this, and this. And, and it uses that as a way, as a welcome message on LinkedIn. I, I'd say those are the three ways that I see working the best right now for video. Yeah, no, I, um, I do the, the well, I, I do the, uh, the LinkedIn message, you know, thanks for connecting video quite a bit. Less now than I used to because I have pretty terrible internet here. So it takes a long time for videos to upload. Um, yeah. What I usually do now is I'll record a, a single video that says, hey, thanks for connecting. And then like everyone who connected with me that day, I give them the same video. So it's not quite as effective as a personalized one, um, but the adjustment, the adapting I have to do, <laughs> right? With the yeah. speed I got here at the house. Um, so thank you for that. I think the next thing I wanted to do is, like, like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, jump into the 
structure, right, of a really good email. But before we get to the structure, one thing I remember from when I was working with you is before we ever wrote our first email, there was a lot of research we had to do. There was a lot of introspection I had to do. There was a lot of like not writing an email work that actually went into the process of writing an email. So for um, for the benefit of people listening here, where do you suggest starting when it comes to like picking your topics and picking relevant messaging before you even I mean, start writing? Yeah, I mean, it really starts with empathy. So who is, is this person that I'm reaching out to and like, what are they experiencing? What, who are they? What are their challenges, et cetera? And oftentimes pro in prospecting, we do the exact opposite. We send messages that are all about us and why we're so awesome. And it completely like, it desensitizes prospects because that's like 99% of the messaging that we get. So what people tend to do is, well, hey, in order to stick out, knowing that people have really low, you know, your short attention spans when it comes to reading stuff or watching stuff or hearing me on the phone, we say, hey, we got to talk faster. We got to talk more about us and why we're better than all the other people reaching out to them when that's not really what gets someone's attention. You know, empathy is something that is a survival skill that, well, the theory behind it, at least how, where it came from is that, you know, people, when they were living in tribes, like the ability to like put yourself in someone else's shoes was a way to identify if someone was like going to be dangerous or not, <laughs> right? An outsider. So this skill that people have of like putting themselves in other people's shoes and like seeing and feeling and thinking about who is this person? What are they feeling? What are they going through? That's an innate thing that every human being needs. Like they, we have a need to feel understood. So if you're not showing that you understand a little bit about who that person is or what's going on in their world, they're not going to want to talk to you. You're, you're very unfamiliar to them and you're just an outsider that doesn't understand. You're just another salesperson, right? So that's where it starts. And there's some really quick, easy, tactical things that you can do. Uh, one of them, I mean, if you're selling you know, SaaS is customer success team. Hey, who are our customers? Like what, what challenges, like what problems are, are they coming to us to get fixed? And like, how do we end up fixing those? Like, what's that before and after picture look like? Um, if you're an SDR or BDR, let's say you're not doing any of the discovery or the demos, like listen to, looks like you're using chorus right now, right? Listen to the chorus calls, the gong calls, whatever call recordings you can. And prospects just totally spill their guts on sales calls. You know, they're like, Hey, you know, if, if we're looking at bomb bomb, for example, people often say stuff like, yeah, you know, we're sending cold emails and people just aren't responding or opening up our emails or, Hey, you know, we're looking for ways to really differentiate from our competitors because they're getting to our prospects first. They're just going to say all kinds of stuff like that and give you the language that you need so that when you go to reach out to someone, it's, Hey, Jonathan, doing some research, yada, yada, yada. Um, I don't know if you're like a lot of the companies in your space, but one thing I'm hearing is this, is that something that you're running across right now? You know, so you can start with that challenge, with that problem and in the hero's journey. So any great story, any movie you've watched, Star Wars, Indiana Jones is something we're going through right now and all the Indiana Jones. Um, dude, it always starts with a character who has a problem, right? In Batman, it's Bruce Wayne. He wants to fight crime. His parents were murdered, right? The, so it starts with him the problem that he's having. And then someone else comes along, Liam Neeson in the you know, League of Shadows come along and says, hey, that's not the smartest way to fight crime, Batman. You don't have to do it inside a jail. You could become a ninja. And that's essentially what Batman's about, which is hilarious. I think about him becoming a ninja essentially in a bat suit, but it starts with him. You know, so the prospect is Batman in this case. And the story is not very interesting if Batman doesn't have a problem. If it immediately goes in and Batman's just kicking butt and, and going to ninja school and doing all this, stuff, like that's entertaining. You're not going to remember that though. You're going to be like, oh, that was a cool action movie. You're not going to really remember the story and like really invest emotionally in there. So that's what we are doing on a really simple basis when we're prospecting is we have to put ourselves in the prospect shoes. We have to understand what their problems are. We got to lead with those problems. And we might not get the problem right. But at least we're showing them that, hey, if you don't have this problem, other people like you are, and it's like we're talking to their world and showing that, hey, there's some credibility here. I'm not just some salesperson trying to sell you stuff and that I have no context into whether or not it will be valuable for you. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that you kind of shared with me a while back was that there are different 
I don't know, levels or layers of pain yeah. points, right? And sometimes you have more or less success whether you're targeting the, the high level pain points or targeting the more granular nitty gritty pain points. Can you explain that a bit? Maybe give some advice on which layer to focus on? Yeah, so there's three different levels. So there's account level, which is really broad. This would be companies like yours are having challenges like this. And that's not really very compelling because you could make that broad statement about like any company in that, uh, in that sector. So you could say small businesses have a lot of challenges with like accurate bookkeeping. Okay. You know, all right. Yeah. Whatever. Doesn't, doesn't really land with me. Right. If I'm a, a small business owner, uh, so there's a catalog, there's persona based. So you could talk to challenges that people have, you know, so if we're using VPs of sales, for example, uh, one thing I hear VPs of sales say a lot is that they have trouble motivating their sales team and getting them to make cold calls. Like you're, we're getting closer, we're getting really warm, right? We're talking about something that's specific to that role, but these situational problems and challenges are where we can really show someone that we know what it's like in their world. And this works, primarily this is gonna work with products because the people that you're reaching out to are gonna be using these products and you're gonna talk about something that they encounter in their workflow. So um, we could use video for example. So an example of a situational challenge might be, uh, hey, Jonathan, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, sales development managers. And one thing they say is that when their reps actually go to start personalizing some of the outreach, they're not really sure what to say that's going to stick out and actually grab the prospect's attention. And they don't want to waste too much time doing the research. And this usually happens on a daily basis when they're sending out their cold emails and making their cold calls. One of the ways that you can keep from wasting time is by replacing that personalization, that, that writing that you're doing with a video, you know? So it's like you're getting into like the thing that actually happens where they encounter a problem that intersects with how you might be able to help. Yeah. One of the ways that I like to think of it in my mind, right, is when I'm creating emails, I try to imagine the target I'm going after. I just try to picture a few moments in their day individual yep. moments in their day where they think to themselves, ah, oh, shit, what made them say, oh, shit, right? What is going on? What's their problem? What's their frustration? And create an entire email around that one moment. Is that, is that good advice? What you say? Yeah. I mean, we can use Calendly or any scheduling app as an example too, because you could just send an email and say, hey, it takes a long time to schedule, right? It's kind of a pain in the butt, right? Well, here's an easier way to do that and save time. It's like, okay, I mean, I might check it out. But if you're like, hey, Jason, a lot of times, you know, what we hear from sales teams is that when a prospect is actually interested in talking to them, they end up sending four, five, six emails back and forth. And it takes a lot of time for them to follow up and get a meeting scheduled. And sometimes the prospect doesn't even end up wanting to schedule a meeting after all that. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. All right. So there's, there's the research, use empathy, find the pain points, the more granular the pain points, the better, rather than these broad sweeping statements of increasing revenue and being more efficient, right? Yep. Um, first challenge of a cold email is then getting them to open it. So now that we have our topics laid out, what kind of advice do you give people on good subject lines? So cool. with the, your open rates, subject line is important, but also the preview text. So just keep in mind, people are going to be able to see the first three, five, seven words of that first line of the email as, and that's just as important as the subject line. So subject lines, keep it super simple. I like to try to put the person's first name in there and their company name if possible. So a really easy one, if you called someone, which I recommend doing, if you call someone first, leave them a voicemail, you can say, hey, Jonathan, just left you a voicemail, right? That's a really good one. Um, the other thing you can do is like one word uh, subject lines, one or two word subject lines that really focus on like the thing that you're reaching out about. So that could be the name of their competitor. Uh, if you're doing some of the stuff we talked about before, it could just be video. For me, I like, sometimes I like to use prospecting or cold calling, cold email or personalization, like, just depending on what that, what that email is about. I also like this rule of three. This is a little trickier to pull off, but uh, if you can find patterns of things, uh, on someone's LinkedIn profile, you can use their language in the LinkedIn, in the, in the subject line. So what you might do is, for example, if you're reaching out to someone, you could see they worked at multiple companies. 
you could put like two of the past companies they worked with. So it could be ABC company, XYZ company, and the company they're currently working with. That's an interesting thing that I've seen work really well. You could also take the language that they use to talk about certain things that are important to them. So if you're reaching out to someone and they talk a lot about the importance of relationships and selling, they're very relationship-based when they sell. Subject line could be relationship-based selling, right? Like something you can literally copy and paste from their LinkedIn profile that's in their words. It could be uh, Jason's recommendation. So if I left a recommendation on this person's LinkedIn, you, like you could put that person's name. So there's all kinds of different stuff that you can do. But the first line of the email, you want to avoid saying, because this is what 99% of emails say, I was, I wanted, I found, I need, my name is, right? So instead of doing that stuff like you, your, uh, this was awesome. Your article on this was awesome. Uh, the podcast you did uh, with so-and-so was awesome. Your company, your ex company value is something I really resonate with. You know, um, we did a, 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 an engagement with a company that sells employee engagement software. So that first line was about the company's values or a social event that we saw them promoting that showed that they really valued like their company culture. Right. So those are some little tricks that you can do to get people to open up emails awesome yeah I've, I've done a couple of those and gotten good success it's tough because you know not a lot of people have a lot going on on their linkedin profile but when you do yeah. find someone who either posts a lot of content or even just has a nice you know description of themselves uh there's a lot you can do there yeah all right so we got them to open the email now in traditional cold emailing that's pretty much the main hurdle is getting them to open the email and then they'll you know almost certainly at least skim through the line of text of what you've written out. With a video email though, there's a second hurdle that has to be crossed, right? Which is clicking play on the video. So what I have found in my work is that whether or not they click play on the video has a huge, huge determining factor is what you wrote in the email, right? Yep. What you typed up. Did you write too much? Did you write too little? So what advice can you give on what you should type up in the body of the email that'll trigger somebody to actually go ahead and watch the video? I mean, I always like to use just the you know, rule of thumb with websites, right? They call the first part of the website where you don't have to scroll the above the fold. So if, you, if you've ever run analytics on a website before or a landing page, you know that dude, like three quarters of the people don't even scroll when they get to the landing page. So the important stuff's got to be right there at the top. So I like putting videos near the top. So it might be like, hey, Jonathan. Um, so if we're using the competitor example, I was... Uh, uh, your competitor, blah, 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 is ranking on your Google AdWords searches or your blank searches. Um, here's a quick video where I outline some of the things that they're doing, right? Something like that. It's like giving them a compelling reason to look at it. Uh, the other thing too is if you're sharing content, for example, you're trying to share something helpful. So for me, if I'm reaching out and, and saying, uh, hey, I want to share these prospecting plays. This is something that we've been working on lately. Like these step-by-step -step plays that reps can run to be more effective with their cold emails and, and uh, cold calls, et cetera. Um, hey, so it'd be like, hey, Jonathan, um, I actually got this one from you because you, you use this. Another guy, Sam Crew, that I interviewed on the podcast uh, does this too. But you can pick two people that would be the users of your product and like make it about them. Oh, it was actually uh, John Mazzo from Lead IQ does this where like they sell a product to salespeople. So he'll like pick like SDRs. He's like, Hey, your reps, uh, ABC rep and XYZ rep, uh, looks like they've been doing this for a while. How's prospecting going for them? I had some ideas here on things they could do with their emails that I see working for other companies. And you can share that in the email. So it's, it needs to be about like, what am I going to get from this video? What am I going to get? Like this teach, don't take philosophy that I talk about. Like, what am I going to learn from, from talking to you? And you can give little previews of that. So workflow is another thing, right? If you able, you're able to visually show. Um, so I'm about to do an interview with this guy. I'm forgetting his name, but with Chili Piper. And what they do is like really cool. So with their videos, they're able to actually show what the landing page or what the signup experience would be like, excuse me, if they were using their product. So like what he'll do is he'll record themselves like actually filling out a contact form and then being like redirected to something, et cetera. And it'll show what the workflow with Chili Piper would be where it would like directly route them to like a, a scheduling link. Um, but it would pick the right SDR or BDR depending on who they're routing it to based on like the parameters that I fill out. 
you know, so he's got like, he can actually show what the workflow would be like and like the amount of time it would save in the, in the how much it would increase the conversions so that you don't have to say, hey, if you use our tool, it's going to increase conversion by two or three. You could just show them and let them come to their own conclusions. Because when you say I can increase this by two to three X, it's, it's relative, right? It's like really hard for people to picture that unless they can see what it is that you're actually going to be doing. And like I said, that's going to be, that's going to be mostly software which I'm guessing is probably the people watching and, and uh, listening to this are mostly selling software. And a lot of times you can visually show elements of what you're doing and how it's helping other people through workflow. So those are just some ideas on things that you can do. I would absolutely agree of that. You know, you have to answer the question, why should I watch this video? Right. Mm -hmm. Because when video email first came out, I think, just the simple fact that there was a video sitting in there was enough. Like yep. there was so much curiosity. People didn't care what you wrote. They were going to watch it because they'd never seen this before. It's still rare, but I think everyone's seen it at least once, especially people who are like in decision-making roles at companies who get a lot of salespeople reaching out. They've seen it once or twice before. The novelty is starting to wear off. So you've got to answer the question, why should I watch this video for them to do it? So I think that's good. Um, one thing that I kind of took away from our work together in the emails that we built together is I realized and the, the, the pattern I keep in my mind is that in the body of the email, I want to mention the pain I'm going to address, right? Hey, I know you have, you know, I know you have problems with this, right? So I want to mention the pain and I want to give them some kind of promise of what they'll get from watching the video. Like mm -hmm. I've worked with some other companies. I have a few ideas, check out the video. So for me, I always ask myself, did I, did I cover the pain I'm addressing and did I make them a promise, right? So it's like yep. pain and promise have to be in the body of the email to trigger them to watch the video. No, I like that. And video has, is going through the same thing that email went through. Dude, email was pretty novel in the early 2000s. If you got an email from someone that you didn't know and it was like a sales email, it's like, oh, wow, how did they get my email? Like, how are they able to do this? So yeah, it's going through the same sort of thing where it's starting to become more of a normal thing. And the pattern interrupt with video is really in the content. What am I able to show someone that's pretty cool outside of just a message of me dumping my sales pitch on this person? All right. Um, I guess I have a nice transition to the last topic there. What do you say in your video to get them to actually respond, right? What are some examples of like, I don't know, terrible videos and things not to say? And what is, what's a better way to, to deliver a video? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it depends on the purpose of that email. So if the purpose of that email is like, hey, I, I am asking for an appointment. I'm not asking them to look at a piece of content or do any of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm asking primarily for interest. So instead of suggesting specific days and times, which people are just getting peppered with, just ask for interest. So like allow them to have some of their autonomy and say yes or no, um, if they want to talk or not. So you might end the video with, um, Hey, so I shared a couple ideas. I have a few more that I would love to share with you, but let me know if this is not something that you're dealing with right now, or if you have a really good handle on this. You know, so it doesn't have to necessarily be a question all the time either. Um, hey, is this worth chatting further about? Um, hey, and I was reaching out to see if, you know, it would be a bad idea if we talked a little bit more about this because I see some ways that you might be able to do this. Or is talking about this or solving this problem something that would be helpful right now or even worth talking about? There's all kinds of different variations of that, but it's like, stop asking like, okay, so I'd love to chat with you next Tuesday at 8 a.m. I left some times in the email that we could chat. You know, it's like, just make it two steps instead of one. Yeah. yeah I've, I've taken and do that in my prospect emails as well, right? Softer, easier, calls to action. Um, yeah, and just, you know, one word of encouragement I throw out there, right, is that from the work that I've done with, you know, people who have bought the product that I sell, um, I have realized what you mentioned before that, you know, I don't remember what phrasing you use, but the phrasing I use is video isn't some kind of silver bullet. You can't just dump a generic boring sales pitch on someone and the fact that you did it with a video changes anything, right? If they don't care who you are and they don't care what you have to say, they aren't going to suddenly start caring because you sent them a video. You've got to make it like to your point, you know, focus on empathy, focus on the pain they're experiencing, focus on the solution you might offer, um, but also leave a little curiosity, right? I would say, don't, don't say everything you have to say in the video, just say enough to pique their interest. And then to your point, close the email off with, did I pique your interest? Is this interesting? Yep. Yep. Absolutely, man. All right. Well, uh, we're about running out on time here. Any final words of advice on video prospecting or video prospecting? Dude, I think the big thing is 
you're really trying to start a conversation with someone. You're not trying to sell stuff when you prospect. So approach it with like, I need to be curious about what this person's situation is, what kind of problems they might be having if, and I can decide if I can help them because I don't know if I can help them or not. The goal of that video, of that email, of that cold call is to start a conversation. It's not to get an appointment. You don't even know if it would be worth talking to them and they don't even know if it would be worth their time. So start a conversation. With emails, you're just trying to get a response. They don't have to say, yeah, I want a meeting. If they just respond with, yeah, I'm actually running across that problem. Here's what's going on. Is that something you can help with? That's really good if they respond. They didn't book a meeting, but they're starting a conversation with you. And that's the hardest part, like you said before, is getting people to open up the emails and just respond to them. So make it easy to respond. Remove the barriers of entry. I don't want to respond as a prospect and feel like I've committed now 30 to 60 minutes of my time with you. I just want to commit to a conversation, man. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jason, for this. I think the knowledge and that you have are exactly what a lot of people need. Um, that being said, a lot of people who have heard this interview are going to realize they have a big appetite for more and they want to learn more from you. So what are some great ways for people to connect with you uh, and you know, check out your services? Yeah, so I'd say the big thing we have going on right now, uh, depending on when this airs, it's going until mid-October, is we're doing a summer virtual tour. So if you've ever gone to a webinar and felt like, oh, man, it's not live, it's pre-recorded, it's like not super tactical in terms of what I'm going to get from it. If you've ever felt that before, we're really doing the exact opposite with the virtual tour. So we're having two to three folks per week on live where you can come in and ask your questions, and it's 100% focused on prospecting. And you can check that out at tour blissfulprospecting.com. It's free. It's live. Check it out. We got all the big names, at least in the tech uh, sales field in there talking about prospecting. And then I would just check out blissfulprospecting.com. We do boot camps if you're an individual rep and want to learn how to do more effective cold outreach. We got a membership there if you're just looking to pay you know, 20, 30 bucks a month for some access to some courses and to participate in the community. And then for companies, we do training and coaching and all that stuff. But it's really all around the problem of like, how do I get my prospects attention, get them to start a conversation, get them to take a meeting with me. Yeah. And I can say, like I said, I've done some work with Jason um, and he's brilliant. All right. Like if you feel stuck and you're prospecting and you think there's nothing else I could possibly be doing better, trust me, this guy will help you find things you could be doing better and open your eyes to new possibilities. So definitely check out blissfulprospecting.com. Sweet. Thanks, man.